work. Okay, right. Um, so hello again, people. <laughs> um, so this is the second session of the day uh, where I'm going to be talking about um, La Fée Vert, Absence and the Green Fairy Myth in 21st Century Gothic. Um, so looking at just the ways that it's kind of been uh, used or repurposed uh, in contemporary settings. Um, so some of you may know who I am. Um, I'm usually lurking on the Twitter. Um, I've tried to do a few uh, tw tweet threads for Romantic the Gothic. So I'm the one that uses all the multitude of gifts. Um, I've been to a fair few conferences in the before times. And um, so I've probably seen one or two of you there as well. Um, so just to make you aware that, um, as I said before, there is a lot of clips in this. Um, so we do have to navigate that. Um, but it's just so that it's got that kind of element so that you can kind of see what it is that I'm, I'm kind of discussing today. And it's also very green, so I do apologise if you uh, get blind by the end because of all it. Um, so just to make you aware, um, some of the clips that I'm using do have flash photography. Um, there is a fair bit of partial nudity as well. There's um, scenes of a mild sexual nature, uh, one use of strong language, um, and there are references to murder, suicide and substance abuse. And um, just to make people aware of that before we begin. So if anyone wants to talk more about anything afterwards today, because if you're anything like me, I can never think of a question at the time. And then afterwards I'm like, oh yeah, I wonder about this. Um, so uh, feel free to um, drop me a line on Twitter. My handle's there, um, obviously an email. I'm a bit slower on the email just because I always forget to check it. Um, so Twitter's probably your best bet. Um, and if you want to tweet along with us today, you're more than welcome. I welcome all the gifts that you can muster. Um, just the hashtags there you can use, um, so obviously Romancing the Gothic um, for people to find if they're unable to attend today, um, and also uh, Gothic Captain as well, if you wish. Right, um, so we'll start today then by talking about the drink absinthe itself. So at its most base form, uh, it's a spirit that was originally produced as a medicine in the 18th century and believed to originate in Switzerland. Um, and went on to become a popular ap aperitif and synonymous with the French Belle Epoque. And it was known to be given to French troops as a malaria preventative, which is probably why it had such a following in France. So much so that at one point uh, between 5 p.m. and 6 p.m., uh, it became known as Leur Père uh, due to the popularity of drinking it. Which, uh, I mean, it's seven o'clock now, so you can have it in Leur Père. <laughs> Uh, so absinthe um, is distilled with wormwood and a variety of other botanicals, usually sweet anise and fennel. And while it's originally clear or blanche, um, further botanicals are used to give it the distinctive green or ver colour. Uh, these botanicals, of course, were often admitted during the periods in which the spirit was banned, uh, so better to conceal it from the authorities. The myth of hallucinations comes from the chemical pihone, a uh, property of wormwood, Yet the levels of this chemical in absinthe are so low, it is unlikely to cause the hallucinations it's reported to. However, it can have an ABV of up to 74%, uh, so hallucinations may be caused by the alcohol rather than the wormwood component. Absinthe was also the reason given for the crimes committed by Jean Lafray in Switzerland in 1905. Uh, the Lanfray murders also dubbed the absinthe murders, uh, so John Lanfrey sentenced to 30 years imprisonment after shooting his pregnant wife, his two daughters, both aged under five, and attempting to shoot himself. Uh, in the subsequent sensationalized trial, his consumption of two glasses of absinthe was blamed as the reason for his homicidal rage, uh, with the multitude of the wine and the other spirits he had consumed that day and his reputation as an angry drunk being dismissed as contributing factors. Landry claimed he did not remember committing murders, and he was found hanging in his prison cell three days after the verdict. However, this case was used as an example of the dangers of consuming absinthe, and thus sparked the drive to ban it, particularly in countries where it gained popularity, such as Belgium, France, and Switzerland, but also as far afield as Brazil. Uh, there was an absinthe revival in the 1990s, um, and the ban of the spirit was only lifted in the USA in 2007. So marketing for absinthe vary between the beautiful and bourgeois uh, to being playful with the dangerous reputation of the spirit. Art Nouveau was a popular design of the fin de siècle and the natural flowing lines and vine-like imagery lend itself well with the fairy motif of the alcohol. 
the Absence Robet poster by Henri Privalivement from 1896 uses mythological imagery to promote the drink. And it is interesting that both this and the Absinthe Blanqui advertisement uh, circa 1900. Uh, now this one's by an unconfirmed artist, uh, but it's mysteriously signed Novaire. So it's known as the Novaire poster. Uh, seem to show a red haired woman clothed in green. This is a motif that continues on through the ages when it comes to depictions of the green fairy. Um, you can also see this in other art at the time, such as Albert Magnon's The Green Muse, uh, which shows a red haired green clad figure rising from a broken bottle, seemingly tormenting the poor absinthe drinker. This ghost like figure of Hangover's Future takes on a more sinister quality than the depictions on the advertisement posters. Of course, absinthe by this point was very much part of French, particularly Parisian culture. The absinthe bourgeois poster was also a popular one, um, with the black cat, of course, being linked with other Parisian motifs such as le chat noir, thus cementing absinthe in the French consciousness. But like any era of poster adverts, artists knew how to play with conceptions. It's still known today that to drink the green fairy meant you would dance with the devil. And so the 1906 design for Morin Le Pied by Leonetto Capiello combines this green coloring with an image of the devil, uh, which is doing something with the bottle, we're not quite sure. Uh, what I found interesting was these traits follow through in 21st century renderings, such as this design by Adam Hill for the 2017 Cape Town Tattoo Expo, uh, their Victorian Oddities exhibition. This particular green used with Art Nouveau style framing, along with some playful Victorian-esque Gothic imagery of the top-hatted skeleton, hinting at the danger so often warned about with regards to absinthe. The absinthe murders were the catalyst for a multi-country ban, and this Swiss poster depicts a triumphant pastor holding a Bible and brandishing a clock aloft, signifying the time up on the sale of absinthe. Uh, over the slain body of the green fairy. The fairy is not only clad in green stockings and heels, signifying her licentiousness, but her skin is also green, emphasizing her connection with the green alcohol and her supernatural quality. The pastor, with his skeletal grin and sunken face, has presumably been the one to impale her heart with a cross-handled dagger to show her full and final death. La fin de la face vert indeed. The fairy, of course, has her breast exposed to fully demonstrate the temptation she poses to the good Christian folk in the background. This was preceded by newspapers reporting on anti-absence rallies um, in the 1907 one there. Um, and it uh, demonstrates the vitriol that was aimed specifically at the drink. In France, it may have also stemmed from the link absinthe had with the artisanal sector. Uh, yet this menu from the dining at the Eiffel Tower in 1889 offers absinthe sorbet as a palate cleanser, uh, demonstrating that it was used in many social circles at the time. And as a sun sponge goth, I am definitely going to be trying out sorbet with absinthe in it. Um, so uh, whether there is any link at all, um, I did come across this uh, 2018 piece by Roberto Fieri, um, which was very much like the Sexy Satan Lecture, which if you haven't seen it, I do recommend, it's fantastic. Um, so this is entitled L'Angelo, la mort de il diablo, uh, which has striking similarities to the Swiss poster. Uh, the slain angel with bare breasts is lying in a similar position, and the figure atop her again bears resemblance to the creepy pastor. It is most likely unconnected, but I just felt it was very similar, just had to include it today. Um, so the idea of the green fairy being a red-haired temptress figure, I would also argue falls in with the depictions of another femme fatale, that of the figure of Jezebel. Uh, Jezebel, who's one of the few women to get a mention in the Bible in the Book of Kings, the wife of King Ahab, she supposedly convinced her husband to abandon the worship of Yahweh and instead worship Baal. She was to have ordered all prophets to be killed as well as the death of Naboth a local man who had inherited lands, namely a vineyard, that Ahab wanted for himself. Jezebel's audacity to have such power angered the prophet Elijah, who sent Jehu to overthrow the usurper couple. And upon her defeat, Jezebel infamously puts on her makeup and was then pushed from her window to be trampled on by the mob and her body eaten by dogs. 
Jezebel was often depicted um, as a cautionary figure to vanity, um, as we can see from the example on the left, um, which is by pre-Raphaelite artist John Byam Liston Shaw in 1896. Um, it shows Jezebel as a vain woman getting ready to face her fate. Here she's depicted as a white woman with red hair. Uh, previous depictions have been um, of uh, ethnic um, depiction. Um, but this white woman, white woman with red hair uh, becomes a pervasive trait, um, with red hair becoming symbolic of temptation and sex, sexuality in many instances of art. Uh, then on to two 21st century examples. Um, here you can see in both the Santiago and the Chadwell, Chadwell um, examples, the red hair remains and both Jezebel's are in language poses. However, with both these artists being women, you can see that the power of the gaze is not in the viewer, but in the subject of Jezebel. At Santiago, Santiago's Jezebel stares out from the canvas with defiance and confidence, and Chadwell's naked version seems to be comfortable in her own skin and is naked for her own sake rather than the sake of the voyeur. Red, of course, is a color associated with passion and temptation, and who better to tempt than the fallen angel himself? As I mentioned before, to drink absinthe is to dance with the devil, uh, yet in contemporary settings, this is seen as not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, this year's delayed Eurovision Song Contest saw Cyprus opening proceedings with their entry titled El Diablo and featured four backing dancers dressed in devilish lycra suits and heels. Um, now this is a clip that may cause uh, irritation for anyone with photo sensitivity. So I'll just get ready. I just love that split hold. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> so um, this song lyrically rejoices in succumbing to the devil and the choreography mimics hellfire and sensuality. The uniformity of the dancers costumes lends itself to the devil being an idea, a flirtation, a feeling rather than a singular physical entity. It also sets off the angelic silver of singer Elena's dress, emphasizing the pull of temptation of the devil dancers. And of course, can I really talk about devil dancing in the year of our Lord 2021 without referencing the explosive, unashamedly queer Montero video by Lil Nas X. So here the devil is the one being seduced uh, by a thigh high booted Lil Nas X performing a lap dance. Um, and this is after he has slid down into hell, literally on a pole. <laughs> um, so both of these are stereotypically feminine dance styles, um, but the role reversal is executed superbly here. Um, but note the red haired weave of the seducer as well, and the control he has of the situation. Satan is also clearly a black male, which again reclaims black bodies, both from the stereotypical racial depictions of the black devil, but also that Lucifer himself, who is usually depicted in white and masculinity uh, when it comes to when he's not in his devilish form. Uh, another instance of dancing with the reclaimed black devil is in Buffy the Vampire Slayer's musical episode, Once More with Feeling. And feel free to click along to this song. So although this is actually a demon named Sweet and not directly Lucifer himself, which is probably owing to the atheist leanings of the disgraced creator, uh, the coding is undeniably the devil. His skin is leathery red, he has an exaggerated goatee styled chin, and he enters the scene suavely in a full red silk suit and tie uh, that he magically tran transforms to blue. Um, despite this, the devil is also decidedly black. Uh, played by dancer and actor Hinton Battle, the tap dance choreography gives a nod to the Nicholas Brothers, and the song composition itself is bluesy. When Dawn, played by Michelle Trachtenberg, who herself has been trained in ballet, is supernaturally commanded to dance with him, it matches the lyrics of hidden desires and secrets that only the devil would know about. But dancing with the devil is not always about unfiltered seduction, however. It also have, has elements of fun and romance. Uh, for example, in the episode of Lucifer, when the titular character played by Tom Ellis goes to Vegas with forensic scientist Ella Lopez, who's depicted also here uh, played by Amy Garcia, they play with the imagery of classic Vegas dances as part of their undercover, complete with feathers and sequins. Yet the devil himself is clothed in a purple satin suit jacket, enjoying the showmanship more than the seduction. 
Uh, and this gorgeous piece on the left by Abigail Larson, uh, entitled Dancing with the Devil, speaks volumes of romance and intimacy. And if you aren't uh, familiar with Abigail's uh, uh, work, please do check her out. Um, her stuff is fantastic. So much Gothic content as well, um, as you can see from this uh, um, example here. So skipping forward to the 21st century, um, an absinthe is still used as a signifier to bohemian pleasure, as well as the ideas of clairvoyancy and the supernatural. In 2001's film adaptation of Alan Moore's graphic novel From Hell, Inspector Abilene, played by Johnny Depp, uses opium and drinks absinthe as he tries to enhance his her clairvoyancy uh, to decipher clues to catch Jack the Ripper. Here he uses what is known as the check style, uh, which is lighting the sugar cube on fire before depositing it into the drink. The film relies on the stereotypes of absinthe, absinthe to further emphasize Aberline's difference um, as a detective, as a clairvoyant, uh, by channeling the hallucinogens in order to catch a vicious killer. As a prop, the absinthe bottle, the glass and the spoon all work to position a timeline in Victorian England. In the HBO series Carnival, um, absinthe is drunk by the blind French seer, Professor Ernst Lopes, as a way to imply his visions are somehow linked to the hallucinogenic, hallucinogenic <laughs> agents of absinthe. Uh, there's also a throwaway quip by the carnival's leader, Samson, uh, played by Twin Peaks legend Michael J. Anderson, uh, about Lopes's alcoholism, uh, terming his use of absinthe as froggy juice, again linking it back to the French Belle Epoque. The ritual of absinthe preparation is also shown, as seen here in this still, with a sugar cube on the spoon and the water in the decanter. Then in Showtime's Penny Dreadful, werewolf Ethan Chandler, played by Josh Hartnett, is invited to Dorian Gray's home. Here, Dorian, played by Reeve Carney, is seen to have an absinthe fountain where the water is iced before dripping it into the glass. The sugar contained in the decadent bowl and the glasses of a bell-bottom style, all presented on a silver tray. Um, this decadent paraphernalia em emphasizes Dorian's bohemia, um, as well as the um, comparative roughness of Ethan, although we later learn that Ethan is from a wealthy American family. The absinthe ritual here is a metaphor for foreplay, um, and their continued eye contact between sips leads to the inevitable consummation. It is implied that absinthe is the cause for the homoerotic union, as it never happens again, nor is it hinted at between the two for the rest of the series. However, as the Gothic is full of references, nods and intertextuality, this scene in Penny Dreadful pays homage to the absinthe scene from Francis Ford Coppola's Bram Stoker's Dracula. Um, just while I think of it, because um, I'll forget by the time it comes to the question, um, the music box style music uh, in the background um, also gives rise to this idea of the fairy that's lingering in the background, um, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, but both Mina and Ethan uh, are tasting absence for the first time. Both are being served by immortal aristocrats in an intimate setting. The sipping of the drink and prolonged eye contact in Penny Dreadful also has similar similarities to this scene. Although whereas in Dracula, the eating of the sugar cube is the sensual element, it is the operatic piece of Tristan and Isolde that Dorian plays that pushes their erotic tension. The influence of the green fairy, the signifiers of bright, almost luminous green clothing and red hair are often used as subliminal met metaphors in order to convey the ideas of seduction, temptation and excess. For example, violinist Lindsay Sterling in her video for the dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy, the ideas of fairy seduction by using this particular color scheme of red and green imply a difference between this fairy and her wintry snow and floral spring fairy characters. Um, so Lindsay Sterling is also an accomplished dancer, uh, classically trained in ballet, she includes dance in her performances, um, and she also featured on Dancing in the Stars, with the stars, sorry. <laughs> um, while not exactly a fairy, Uma Thurman's Poison Ivy mixes the intoxication of the Absinthian Green Fairy with the temptation of Jezebel. Again, clad in luminous green and sporting striking red hair, and it's all wrapped up in a delightfully camp 90s gothic bow. And then this promotional poster for a B-side horror film released in 2020 called Medusa, 
also draws upon these ideas of danger and temptation with this particular green. But possibly the most mainstream iteration of the green fairy post-millennium is the cameo by Kylie Minogue in Baz Luhrmann's Moulin Rouge film um, from 2001. Um, so the film follows Ewan McGregor's character Christian as he meets the artist Henry de Toulouse-Lautrec, who is perhaps possibly the most notorious absent drinker in Parisian circles, and enters the magical world of the Moulin Rouge, uh, where he falls in love with Nicole Kidman's red-haired Satine. This scene shows the bohemian group of writers and artists indulging in absence, again in the Czech style, by setting the sugar aflame in a dramatic way. Uh, the Green Fairy makes an appearance uh, to convey their intoxication, emerging from the label on the bottle. Uh, Minogue's fairy is a darkly red-haired temptress, um, as opposed to Satine's more uh, vibrant red, as you can see from the uh, poster here. Um, and she's in sparkled heels, sequins, and voile, switching between balletic armography to seductive body movements, yet also begets a muse-like quality with the use of the song The Hills Are Alive With The Sound Of Music conveying imagination, creativity, and hope. However, like all Faye, she is not all as she seems, as at the end of her appearance, her eyes glow a devilish red and she emits a demonic laugh. Christian's muse then changed from the bohemian shared green fairy to his own Satine, which is possibly another reason why Minogue's green fairy does not appear again in the film. And I also came across these two images, uh, so the top uh, right is of a Moulin Rouge can, -can dancer, uh, all dressed in green. Um, and then the other is an Art Nouveau throwback poster design uh, that depicts Satine dressed in green uh, with the absinthe vapor curling around her and a very small green fairy in the top corner, um, which I thought was fantastic as a throwback to like the absinthe for bet posters. Um, there has been one other reimagined Moulin Rouge and it was from the Royal Winnipeg Ballet Company with choreography by Jordan Morris. Uh, the plot differs slightly from the film in order to make it fit as a ballet piece rather than a theatrical one. And it includes some fantastically choreographed numbers such as a can-can on point, uh, the tango also on point, and two dances with the green fairy. Uh, the first being with Toulouse-Lautrec as he aims uh, for inspiration for his art, and the other uh, with the danseur noble, uh, which is the uh, prima male ballerina. Um, so the clip here is from the promotional footage of their 2014 performance. So this is of the one um, with the second um, appearance of the Green Fairies. So this scene shows the love interest Mathieu dancing with three Green Fairies after having drowned his sorrows in absinthe with his friend Toulouse-Lautrec. Um, after the prima ballerina character of Natalie reluctantly promises to never see him again to save him from the jealousies of Zidler, the owner of the Moulin Rouge. Mathieu's Pas de Quatre dance is languid, sensual, and far more sexualized than any of the Pas de Deux sequences between Mathieu and Natalie, uh, or even the majority of the Moulin Rouge dances, um, with the exception of the tango sequence. There is an intimacy between the dancers, whereas the previous incarn incarnation with the Green Fairy and Toulouse-Lautrec was more playful. Mathieu, through absence, is able to dance out a fantasy with the fairies that he's prevented from dancing with Natalie. The Prima Fairy is wingless, marking her out to be more of the queen figure than the other two winged dancers. And the lighting designs used in this scene as well almost looks like a kind of hypnosis or dreamlike quality, uh, or a feeling of being underwater. Um, again, alluding to the otherworldly nature of the fairies. Drinking absinthe, the partaking of fairy substance, takes you to another realm out of your own reality. And then in this final section, uh, we're going to come to the Las Vegas burlesque show Absinthe uh, by Spiegel World, uh, that's still ongoing at Caesars Palace, um, and it's incorporated COVID safety measures uh, within the act, which is one of the few Vegas acts that's been able to do so. So described in the New York Times as being like Cirque du Soleil channeled through the Rocky Horror Picture Show, which I think is the only um, <laughs> description it needs to promote it, uh, which is, um, so the Green Fairy is alluded to uh, with the alcohol in the show before she takes a turn on the circular stage in person. 
So the Green Fairy here is played by burlesque performer Hazel Honeysuckle. Uh, her social media is on there as well if you want to check her out because she does some fantastic stuff. Um, and uh, she uses a mix of aerial tricks and traditional burlesque dance in her act. And again, note the red hair and green attire. Uh, so I'll play the short clip here. And again, full warning, this is a burlesque show in Sin City. So there is going to be partial nudity. <laughs> So here, the Green Fairy is fully aware of her intoxication influence. Her sexual allure and playful nature all come to the fore in this show, uh, which is why I feel burlesque is a perfect setting for a modern take on the Green Fairy. Her costuming is exquisitely detailed, from the glittered corset to the delicate wings, to the bejeweled thong and green nipple tassels. Her unseely course, as seen here by the four male performers, uh, aids in her performance and let her call the shots. The mortals in the audience can look, but not touch. Be a part of the experience, yet still be removed from it. The fae power here is reclaimed in a performative setting, somewhat removed from the likes of the recent National Theatre's production of A Midsummer Night's Dream. The ethereality is replaced by blatant desire, the otherworldliness made real through the stunts and tricks of the performers, the gay merriment of fae song and dance made flesh for mortals to enjoy, but not to own. Um, so just to finish off, I have a shameless plug <laughs> um, about our fledgling research project, uh, Mahabra Dance. Uh, so it's run by uh, Dr. Karen Graham, uh, Dr. Kaya Frank and myself, uh, where we aim to look at the ways in which the Gothic and dance intersect, um, particularly ballet at the moment. Um, so our Twitter handle here is at Dance Gothic and Dance with an S. Um, and you can check out the hashtags of Ballet Gothic and Macabre Dance, again with an S. Um, to see some of the things we've done so far, uh, we've come, done a couple of tweet alongs uh, for some ballet performances. Uh, and we try and do a thing uh, weekly called What's on Wednesdays, um, where we have a mini thread of things upcoming into Gothlandia, things like call for papers, uh, creative writing submissions, online events, podcasts, upcoming conferences, reading groups, things like that. Um, so if you have anything you want to promote, just slide into our DMs um, and we'll feature you on one of our weekly uh, threads. Um, or you can ping us an email, but we don't tend to pick up the email as much as the Twitter, so just to make you aware of that. Um, and we have a few announcements upcoming ourselves when we've got some details finalised, uh, so watch this space. Um, and also, if you have anything uh, Gothic dance related you want us to look at, then please throw it our way. We're more than happy to have a look at anything. <laughs> um, and finally, I just wanted to thank um, Sam for giving me the opportunity to wax lyrical today. Um, so I'm hoping you found it fun. Um, again, my Twitter handle is here if you have any questions that you don't manage to think of until later, um, or if you have anything that you want to point in me in the direction of. And thank you for your time. <laughs>